the experts. Nothing in human history has raised more heads than the spectacle of the night sky. Yet, our relationship with it has never been static. Awestruck by its appearance, we first attributed the extraordinary events above to fantasies and angry spirits. But of course, when we learned to make this a science, it gradually revealed to us both an unimaginably vast universe and our minute place in it. One of the greatest objects that aided in this was the telescope. And in just a few centuries, we went from peering through simple glass discs to analyzing infrared imagery sent from outer space technology. 21st century astronomy feels every bit fantastical as it does analytical. Astronomers today use state-of-the-art technology to gaze into the depths of our cosmos and discover the very limits of our universe. Our expert today is Professor Paul Delaney, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at York University, the Carswell Chair for the Public Understanding of Astronomy, specializing in variable stars and astronomy education and outreach. It was around about age eight or nine, somewhere in that vicinity, my grade three. For whatever reason, and I can't pinpoint the reason, I had a fascination with the planets of our solar system. So much so that my grade three teacher actually wrote in the end of year report, has great knowledge of the planets of our solar system. That was arguably the earliest moment where somebody very specific said, he's obviously got a bit of an interest with, you know, in that case, solar system space. After that, it just seemed to be natural. I would be watching science fiction on TV. This is, you know, in and around the time where Lost in Space and Star Trek were coming out. It was the height of the space race between the US and the Soviet Union, the race to the moon that was instigated by Kennedy. Everything in school back in Adelaide, South Australia, seemed to be geared towards exciting me about the idea of space travel, of space exploration and astronomy in general. From that moment forward, it was never any question. I did not want to be a fireman, I did not want to be a policeman, I did not want to be fill in the gap. I only wanted to be an astronomer, which worried my parents because they didn't know what jobs were available for astronomers at that point in time. But uh, that's when it all started. Over 40 years, there, there are many. Some of them have been in the classroom. Some of them have been at the eyepiece of a telescope. Some of them have been associated with the unraveling or the unveiling of a particular event that has taken place in astronomy. Astronomy is, is not a static field. Things keep changing. I remember back at the University of Victoria one night, it was before the age of computers, it was one of those dusk to dawn type observing sessions. Uh, astronomers start out just after sunset, you would be observing all night and then you'd go to bed as the sun would rise. It was a really nice warm evening in August. The sky was, was crystal clear, it was nice and warm. I remember I was in a shirt sleeve environment, the data was flowing and it just, a degree of serenity came over me, I guess. And some of these really nice moments are literally when it's just the universe and me hanging out together. There's a great sense of, of calm and, and beauty associated with it. It's been a much more personal, this is it, this is where I, I really belong and I've enjoyed that, that moment of belonging. Over the last 30, 40 years, there have been many significant changes in astronomy, realizing that the universe was accelerating its expansion rate, finding exoplanets, those planets beyond our solar system, the search for, for life elsewhere. These are, are topics which you know, pop up time and time again in the classroom. I, I guess one of the ones that I do remember most uh, was when we had found exoplanets for the first time. Looking for planets outside of our solar system had been on the agenda, the astronomical agenda for decades, and I had grown up with it through school, primary school, uh, high school, university, uh, my you know, first decade or so of teaching here at York, looking for exoplanets, Canada's involvement in looking for exoplanets. Everybody expected planets to be around other stars, until you actually find them, you can't be certain that that's the case. And then the announcement came uh, in 1995, and of course since then we've found four and a half thousand more exoplanets. The university gives you the foundation, but the house is still being built all through your career. You read, 
popular articles, you read scientific journals, you communicate with your colleagues, you watch even you know, uh, presentations on TV. It's, it's a continuous learning curve. And the students, of course, force you to you know, stay on top of it because some of them are more on top of it than you are in certain key areas. And so you've got to you know, have your full game when it comes to the classroom environment with your students. You can't be shy about learning you know, how to use that technology. You know, a good example is, is you know, your smartphones. You know, 25 years ago, your smartphone was a dumb flip phone if, if it was even flippable. Uh, but now your, your phone is so much more than a phone uh, and everybody you know, relies on it. That transition over the last 20, 25 years in technology certainly applies to astronomical instrumentation. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be willing to change uh, and embrace these new technologies and to pick and choose because some are better than others. But yeah, it's a continuous process that you engage in being a scientist and being a, uh, an educator. When I came to York, when I was you know, going through my graduate studies, you'd be at the telescope and you'd be taking some images and then you'd go to the dark room and you'd develop them up and 45 minutes later you'd be looking at that information going, oh rats, and you'd have to go out and do it all over again and, and, and so on and so forth. Now your CCDs, your charge coupled devices, they're on the back end of the telescope. They're a hundred times more efficient. They take an image and you see the results a few seconds later and you go, oh, and then a few seconds later you've got the right image. <laughs> the CCD has transformed uh, what we've been able to do in astronomy and it has reached to the point where amateur astronomers have great access to these CCD devices. They're no longer just in major observatories, they are in backyard observatories allowing amateur and professional astronomers to engage in a way that you know, few other disciplines are able to. A 100 meter telescope, they're coming. They're not going to come in my, my uh, professional lifetime. You know, I grew up in the era of five meter telescopes and we thought that was really, really great. And then we began to get creative in the 70s and people started thinking, okay, well, maybe we can make bigger telescopes, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a single piece of glass. And so all through the 80s and the 90s, the next generation telescopes were being envisaged. We started creating six and a half meter mirror blanks and then eight meter mirror blanks and then we created the Keck telescope which was segmented mirrors 10 meters in diameter and now we've got sort of 10 and 11 meter diameter telescopes scattered all around the planet but 30 meter telescopes are going to happen just beyond my professional lifetime. Say Levy, that's just the way it is, but I'll be able to see their results. The 100 meter telescope, I suspect you will see within about 20 years and you know, I'll still be alive to see it, at least I hope. You know, the, te the students who I'm currently teaching, it'll be a part of their professional lives, I feel sure. And what you'll be able to do with that, as I say, you'll be able to see further than we've ever been able to see before. You'll be able to see with greater detail than we've ever been able to see before. And the discoveries that will come with that is in the realm of science fiction at the moment. Uh, but, you know, they are coming. Those telescopes are coming. You've got to be prepared to you know, work hard in the physics, math, computer science, engineering realms. It's not for the faint of heart. You know, not everybody is cut out to do the math and the physics required of this discipline. And you have to excel at it because you can't reach your dreams with just, generally speaking, a bachelor's degree. You've really got to do graduate work, at least a master's degree, preferably a PhD. So it's a lifelong commitment and it really does require a degree of excellence or at least very high competence. You've got to be able to work with people, you've got to be able to effectively communicate. That's not often underscored enough. You can't operate in isolation. We don't build big telescopes. We don't engage in big scientific projects and we don't go to the stars with rockets and so on unless you're a part of a big group. You don't do it in isolation. So as you're working through all of these you know, subjects and excelling at them at the university level, you're also building a team of people around you and you're learning how to effectively communicate.
Most astronomers end up working at universities. It's only a very small fraction of us that are actually full-time at an observatory. But our days are actually pretty much the same as most other people's in terms of the time slot. We will only be observing on big telescopes during the course of the year four, five, six nights a year, perhaps tops. And you'll collect enough data that might keep you busy for a year or two. So there's not that many nights that are spent at big telescopes because there are a lot of astronomers and you know there's not enough telescopes and so you know you, you just don't get all the nights that you want and then of course if you are at the university with smaller telescopes yes there's more nights available but even here I might only observe 15 to 20 nights per year so most of our work is done during the day so we're not vampires and so on we are really workers who uh, you know do our work during the day Anybody who spends time at the telescope, looking at the night sky, analyzing the universe from a mathematical perspective, can't help but be struck by the beauty that is inherent in the universe. When I look at the night sky, as I said, I, I cannot help but be struck by its majesty. Anybody who has been in a dark site, away from the bright light pollution of the cities, it's just gorgeous to see the Milky Way arching overhead. And then the more you explore the night sky and the universe as a whole, the more wonder it beholds. I always start off my evening by looking at those, you know, really nice objects that anybody would enjoy. There's no better feeling for me than to look at the rings of Saturn or the cloud belts associated with Jupiter. Even the moon, which, you know, is a bright source of light and can be really annoying, you know, showing the craters and the mountains on the moon. Those are wonderful objects to really get people excited about what is in the night sky. I think there are a couple of good reasons why making ourselves a multi-planetary species, as Elon Musk would say, to go to other places. And it's not because, you know, humanity needs to try and shuffle people off world and to reduce overcrowding. You'll, you'll never go to the moon and Mars for those sorts of reasons. It's just too expensive to send that number of people out there and our, our technology is too feeble. But going to these places gives us perspective. You know, we are going to go there and we're going to find answers to questions that we're asking about the home environment. To be able to sort of you know, monitor and experience other weather systems, to be able to look at other planetary environments and relate that back to the way the Earth is and the way the Earth formed. You know, having a sample of one, us here on Earth, is not the scientific way. You've got to have more than a sample of one to better understand how this place came into being. But I think at an even more fundamental level, humanity has always been a species of explorers. You know, we've always been interested in looking over the horizon, of traveling whatever direction to see what is beyond our local environment. I, I think it is hardwired into us to ask the questions of exploration. I like hardcore science fiction. Some of the, the, the masters of the, the 20th century, I still like reading. James Hogan, more modern people, uh, Kirby, Heinlein is another one, Asimov of course, you know, some of the, the real masters of the 20th century slowly being replaced by people here in, in the 21st century. Anything in the hardcore science fiction, I'm there, absolutely. I like reading about Mars and uh, the exploration of Mars. The Martian was very good. We actually took 300 high school physics students and their teachers out to the local Colossus Theater and showed them The Martian and then did a Q&A panel at the front of the room after it. That was a good movie. There was only a couple of tiny little flaws in there. And the wind on Mars would never have picked up that radio dish and skewered uh, the, the astronaut. The wind is just too feeble on Mars for that sort of thing. But other than that, every other aspect of that movie was really, really excellent. Humanity has always been interested in what's over the horizon. And the biggest horizon out there is the astronomical horizon. Understanding how the universe has evolved, how the pieces from 14 billion years ago fit to today, and how today is going to evolve into tomorrow. Looking for the signs of life, the big question of whether or not we are alone in this universe. Those types of questions, to me, 
drive the human spirit and astronomy is right on that vanguard. To me, it would be wonderful if humanity could get over a lot of its, you know, warring factions and band together and fight the space environment to be able to overcome the challenges associated with traveling in space and living on a distant planet, to be able to go there like the International Space Station and collaborate, pool your resources and to be able to explore that new environment together sounds very futuristic and high ideals and so on but gosh you know those sorts of ideals is what has driven humanity i think from you know the outset space environment is just the next huge hurdle for us to be able to overcome uh, so i think at a fundamental human spiritual level we need to explore if there is something that you're very passionate about follow your dream because if you end up in a job, not necessarily astronomy or space science, but in a job where you are really excited about what it is you're doing from day to day, then you get out of bed in the morning, you never work a day in your life because you're going off to do what you love to do, your hobby. And I'm, you know, I, I personally feel singularly really, really pleased that I can be paid for doing something that is almost a hobby to me. I've never worked a day in my life and I'm proud of that. Join us next episode where we offer a novel angle into this very field and ask another expert fundamental questions about our universe. That and a whole lot more in the next episode as we continue our journey of knowledge with the experts.